colleague Ben is going to be uh, presenting this next session on communal tenure and the questions about what is the nature and the status of property rights held by about one third of our population. It's quite an astonishing thing to think that a third of our population are living in areas that were formerly designated as former homelands or Bantustans and in the post-apartheid era, we have not been able to clarify and confirm the nature of these property rights of about a third of our population. So I'm going to hand over to Ben to talk about communal areas, communal tenure and traditional authority um, uh, for 10 minutes, following which we'll have open discussion, then we move on to other sessions. I did want to add one thing. Several people are asking for two things. One is, can we have some PowerPoint presentations with some data, some statistics, some details? And in fact, while we didn't want to bore you with lots and lots of PowerPoint, we have all of that. So we will email you a whole suite of presentations from across all of these themes, uh, redistribution, restitution. We can share with you, uh, obviously, the, the historical story. Um, we, will, we will share all of that with you. A second thing that people are asking for is, who can we contact to talk about these things? Are there particular people, case studies, contact details, emails, and phone numbers? Um, and so we can commit, Ben, what is our time frame? Within the coming week, is that right? Yeah. Within the coming week, we can share with you both our presentations and also a set of contact numbers uh, and details. And those will include both, you know, successful farmers on the ground somewhere in Mpumalanga or KZN or Limpopo or whatever. But also, who are the key people, the activists, the thinkers, the researchers, the historians, and so on? So we'd love to share with you a short uh, section of, of contact details. Over to you, Ben. Thanks. I mentioned earlier this morning the difficulty of simplifying complex material, um, and I've got 10 minutes. And this is, issue of communal tenure is very complicated, so I've got a real challenge on my hands. And I want to, I'm going to talk not only about communal tenure, but about property rights in general. Okay. So this is an area um, showing the areas which became the the Bantu stands, the communal areas, the, th the infamous 13% of the country. This is an, uh, a map showing uh, relative poverty in the country. And if you compare those two maps, you will see that the former Bantu stands are the areas with the highest levels of poverty and deprivation in the country. They correlate almost precisely. Of course, there are districts where we also have large populations of very poor farm workers as well. So it's not 100% fit. That's, that's the legacy from the past that we have to deal with. In 1994, <clears throat> what did we inherit from 300 centuries of oppression and apartheid rule? Black land rights had a second class status in law. They had few protections against arbitrary deprivation. They were mostly embodied in so-called PTOs, Permission to Occupy Certificates, issued in the apartheid area by magistrates. Uh, actually, they did have some legal content, but um, they were never enough to prevent the government from arbitrarily depriving people of rights. For example, in so-called betterment planning, land use planning, which said to people, you will not, no longer cultivate this field, you will go and live in this particular area, we are going to chop up your grazing land into designated paddocks, whether you like it or not. Those are major deprivations of property rights, and government proceeded with impunity. In particular, land rights held by communities in forms of shared land tenure, collective land tenure, so-called communal tenure, or what we call social tenures, at very poor levels of recognition. And as a result of lack of recognition and support, they eroded over the decades and were subject to a partial breakdown. In particular, manifested in increasing levels of abuse by some traditional leaders and chiefs, increasing tensions with civics, increasing tensions with the liberation movement. In the late 1980s, 
massive struggles took place in South Africa's rural areas, with activists from the liberation movement targeting corrupt chiefs who were in key positions in old Bantustan governments, engaged in many crooked deals. We seem to have forgotten that history in the recent flirtation with the chieftaincy. In addition to communal areas, there were black uh, communities owned land in white farming areas. After, uh, from the, the late 19th century onwards, in fact, groups of black people bought farms. They clubbed together money, they sold their cattle, they bought farms because they saw that they had to be owners in order to have their land rights protected. Subsequently, they were forcibly removed from those so-called black spots. When they were the owners and occupiers, they were not allowed to own them in their own right because blacks could not own land in white areas. They had to, uh, the owners were, were trustees of one kind or another, either church people or institutions or government officials or wherever. So one call, post-1994, by groups such as the Buffalo King is give us back ownership of our own land. Buffalo King are lucky because they occupy platinum-rich land. They're now the richest so-called tribe in Africa. They still do not, do not actually own their land. It's still state land. And there are many other communities who made the, sim the similar call. Uh, people were the victims of forced removals from white farming areas, from towns and cities, through Group Areas Act, through the evictions of one kind or another. And they were, forced, they were told to go and live in their homeland, so-called. In KwaZulu, in Kavenda, Leboa, Paputaswana, whatever. And people were then placed under the jurisdictional authority of chiefs, traditional leaders, with whom they had had no previous connection. Uh, and um, yeah, so we had, that's another legacy that had to be dealt with in 1994. As a result of forced removals and dumping of people in overcrowded areas, there was a forced overlapping of rights. So rural communities were often forced to host refugees from apartheid, so to speak, and forced to accept them as people living on their land. And often they did so willingly, sometimes unwillingly, but they were sometimes paid rent and sometimes not. So in the 13%, there was massive overcrowding as a result of the deprivation of black land rights in other parts of South Africa. So one of the legacies that we have to deal with is the unpacking of those overcrowded, overlapping rights situations. And of course we also inherited a situation of deep discrimination against women, high levels of gender in inequity, and in particular the insecurity of widows, divorcees, and single women, who according to custom would not be allocated land because they were not heads of families. And many other problems, this is just a, uh, a sketch. So, 1994, passed the new constitution, adopted in 1996. What does section 25.6 of the constitution say? You've got a copy. A person or community whose tenure of land is legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices is entitled to the extent provided by an act of parliament either to tenure which is legally secure or to comparable redress. Comparable redress precisely in order to assist with the unpacking of those situations of forced overcrowding. If you can't secure people's rights where they are, you have to give them additional lands somewhere else, hence comparable redress, perhaps in some cases compensation. Uh, Section 25.9 of the Constitution says Parliament must pass such an act. It has not done so as yet in respect of communal areas, 24 years after democracy, that's why they're in breach of the Constitution. They've attempted to pass a law, the Communal Land Rights Act of 2004, was struck down by the Constitutional Court in 2010 on procedural grounds, but the judges made it clear that the substantive arguments of the applicants were very powerful. The applicants for rural communities argued that the Communal Land Rights Act rendered them less secure rather than more secure than they were before. And we'll come back to those arguments. We also uh, passed in 1996 the Interim Protection of Informal Land Rights Act, now EPILRA. An interim act because it was a holding measure only. It had to, it's had to be renewed annually every year since, in the absence of the overarching legislation. The PILRA has never been used, it's never been implemented. A few lawyers occasionally make reference to it. It provides basic protection against deprivation of rights. It says that you cannot, 
people who hold informal land rights, not recognized by law, i.e. most black South Africans, cannot be deprived of those rights without their consent. So it's a powerful law, even though it's only three pages long, but it's never been used. The high-level panel of Parliament recently recommended that it be made a permanent piece of legislation and that other pieces of legislation like the Mineral and Petroleum Resources Development Act, the NPRD, NPRDA and the Ingunyama Trust be made subject to IPILRA. In other words, people could not lose land to mining operations without the consent. The 1997 White Paper, which is a powerful document, a very elaborate framework of land reform law, still worth referring to. You can still download it from the department's website. It's worth looking at. It's coherent. It's, a, it's very ambitious. It's, it's uh, largely been... Uh, it's still the basis. It provides the basis for government's land reform programs. But in practice, uh, it's the, the necessary modifications, refinements, adjustments in the light of experience have not been made. Uh, the only replacement for the 1997 white paper was a 2011 green paper released by Mr. Quinty, the former minister, 11 pages long, mostly bullet points, mostly rhetoric, almost no substance, and that's been the only guiding document for land reform policy since 1997. So, yeah, this question of policy drift. Okay, so, so we say we're going to secure land rights. In particular, let me focus on the uh, communal areas. Now, we just have to take a slight sideways leap and talk about property rights in general and about the particular nature of what we call social tenures. Here I'm using a term from our recent book released last year, Untitled. There's a flyer for it in your pack. My co-author and co-editor, Lauren Royston, is here. And we make an argument that private property, individual private property, as reflected in a title deed in the deeds registry, is a very particular and limited form of property right. It is dominant in the West, but it does not apply to the majority of people in the world, and it doesn't uh, really help the majority of South Africans either that particular form of title deed. It's very restrictive, it's expensive, it's cumbersome. According to our book, 60% of South Africans hold land and property outside the formal title deed system. So what, are the, what is the character of these other land tenure systems, social tenures, in particular in communal areas in South Africa? Oh, we have to try and go fast. This is a diagram which tries to summarize it. Basically, these are socially embedded systems Social relations are key to who gets a right and to the nature of that right. These rights are shared. You get rights to residential land, to arable land, and to common property, communal resources. Those rights derive most fundamentally from accepted membership of a group. Um, uh, they're acquired through birth, affiliation, or through transactions. They are relative rights. They are shared rights, and they're inclusive rights which make them completely different to individual private property. They are nested within community organization at different levels, from the family, through neighbors, through the ward, up to the larger community. As a result, they have flexible boundaries. This is why they're inclusive. This sets them apart from private property. Of course, if we were to recognize these rights in, in the form of a certificate of some kind, that would be a kind of title deed, if you like, but it's completely different to the surveyed, inflexible, single-owner form of private property which is dominant in our society. So title deeds do not fit the situation. So how do we recognize these rights in law? That's the challenge for policymakers. Whoops. I think I've... It's finished now, anyway. It's fine. Um, the policy dilemmas... Uh, th I would now we have a history in Africa in general and in South Africa of interference with indigenous systems of land rights derived from custom and in many instances these systems of land rights have been distorted through centuries of top-down authoritarian rule which rendered traditional leaders accountable to the state usually a state um, in the interests of a racial minority rather than rendering those leaders accountable to their people, as was the case in pre-colonial times. So it's a very distorted version of communal tenure which has come down to us. And in addition, we've had this history of forced removals, overlapping rights, and so on. 
So how do we secure la- uh, rights in group systems? Should we do it through recognition of customary rights? Or should we seek to give it some form of private ownership? If they're customary rights, how do we determine their content? In group-based systems, where should we vest the rights? Should we vest the rights in the members of these groups or in an institution representing the group, like a communal property association or a traditional council? If we're going to vest land in communities, which level of community? Is it the immediate neighbours who make many decisions, hold land in common? Is it the ward? where other resources such as grazing are held in common? Is it the group as a whole, which in some instances, in Singa, it's 60,000 people belong to the Mpunu tribe. In other cases, it's 250,000. Which level of community do you vest rights in? These are quite powerful dilemmas, and it means that recognizing social tenures in law is not straightforward. It's complicated. And it's also a question of, if we're saying rights derived from custom, whose version of custom? Chiefs in, the, in South Africa today assert a distorted version of custom which suits their own interests. It's an authoritarian version in which they're not accountable. You're going to have to give me more time. No, Benny must finish up. <laughs> She's looking at me. Um, or, as some of us would propose, should it be a living form of custom, which the Constitutional Court recognizes. A form of custom which is dynamic and adaptable and changes, and which is increasingly seen by ordinary South Africans as consistent with the Constitution, with its requirements, for example, for equality. So single women in Msinga are asking for land in their own right because they say, we have children, we are not married, we we need land to live on, please give us land in our own right. And in one case, the Mpunu tribe, they've decided to adjust custom and make it possible to award single women land. This is an example of living custom. So the question is how do we recognize such rights in law when our whole legal system is premised on private property? That's the policy challenge. So what's happened since 1994? In 1999 a land rights bill was uh, developed which vested protected rights in individuals and families relative to the rights of others as a group agreed in group rules. In, 2000, in, in 1999, the new Minister of Land Reform, uh, Togo Dodiza, threw it out and said it involved too much support from the state, it was a nanny state, which is the word she used, and she developed a new model, the Communal Land Rights Act, which saw a transfer of title paradigm, transferring ownership of communal land notionally in the hands of the state to institutions vesting ownership rights, private ownership rights, in institutions, traditional councils, in her case, with no real choice allowed the residents of the area as to whether they wanted the traditional council to administer their land or not, including no choice for those people who'd been placed under the jurisdiction of chiefs under apartheid. So no choice, apartheid boundaries, a distorted version of custom. And if the Constitutional Court had heard the substantive arguments, it seems to me clear that they would have thrown it out on substantive grounds, not only on procedural grounds. Civil society brought this case, uh, made powerful arguments, and argued for a different system, vesting shared rights in the members of those groups relative to the rights of others. The Communal Land Tenure Bill of 2017 is very similar to the Communal Land Rights Act of 2004, which is struck down, and it's going to run into the same problems at at the Constitutional Court. What's happened since 1994, in the absence of legislation, is that government has become increasingly sympathetic. The ANC has become sympathetic to the arguments of chiefs. They see them as a powerful constituency, which can guarantee the rural vote, I think mistakenly in my view. But rural elites have taken advantage of the insecure rights of ordinary people to enter into business deals with mining companies, agricultural development companies, property development companies. There's some powerful cases before the courts the Bachata Bachafela, the Bafok King, the Kolobeni case, wild case, is coming up in the Constitutional Court next week, a very important case. People are saying, it's our land, we don't want mining, please go away. Government is saying, no, 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 this is state-owned land. We, we think mining is good for you. It's a fundamental question of rights. In the Pazulu Natal, just before 1994, the old government entered into a deal with the IFP and they created the Ingunyama Trust. Ingunyama is the Zulu king in Silu. Now, good king, good, Goodwill is Zuelatini. 
The Ingunyama holds land in trust, much in the same way as the South African state does everywhere else, for the people in the former KwaZulu. It, the Act enjoins the Ingunyama Trust to administer that land in the interests of its benefit of, of the members of the people living on that land. In, in, in recent years, the Ingunyama Trust has abused its powers and is now busy trying to convert people's customary rights, which are akin to ownership, into leaseholds, le into leasehold, into rent-paying leases, which are increasing and escalating every year. It is clearly unconstitutional. It is being litigated. And for the Ingunyama, it was Velatini and, and uh, Butelezi to argue that government is trying to take Zulu people's land rights away from them. Exactly the opposite is the case. The Ingunyama Trust is taking people's land rights away from them. And this illustrates a more general point, as does the cases uh, in areas where mining is taking place. Expropriation without compensation is happening on a large scale right now. It's happening to black South Africans. In fact, it could be argued that the notion of a real de a debate about expropriation without compensation is an attempt to distract us all from these realities. And it's an attempt to hide the fact that the land rights of the majority of black South Africans are still insecure in law and are subject to the deals of elites, which the g government has been intent to hide away from public attention. Okay, so there's a whole spectrum of opinions here. Government, I'm uh, sorry, the chief's lobby, Contralesa, says, trust us, we're the custodians of custom. Other people argue traditional leadership should be abolished altogether. It should simply be, communal land should be simply democratized. Other people would say, allow traditional leaders a role. In they recognize they have roles to play, make them accountable, but allow them a key role in dispute resolution. Other arguments are that we should vest rights to shared land in social tenure system in individuals and families not in institutions, allowing for choice, allow for flexible boundaries, but of course subject to shared uh, rules about how this land is administered. And the high-level panel of Parliament makes two powerful arguments. Firstly, make Ipilra permanent, and secondly, create a new Land Records Act to record and register all forms of informal land rights. This is a very powerful proposal. It's uh, there on Parliament's website. It would be revolutionary if it was implemented. It would require a rethink of land administration in this country, but potentially it could solve many of these problems if the state was serious about it and developed the capacity to implement it. There's another view held by the Free Market Foundation and others, possibly by the majority of the middle class in South Africa, black and white, is that freehold title, individualized private property, is the only secure form of land tenure. It should replace com communal land tenure, and, it, it's, it's, uh, and one of the motivations is that it will facilitate loans from the banks. You can offer your land as collateral, which is a myth, by the way, with, with respect to poor rural people. There are many cases, many stories you can follow, the Ingunyama story, the mining story, the litigation, the uh, LRC is entering to litigation on tribal levies. There's this question of electing headmen democratically in the Eastern Cape, the Kala case. And there's a question of women's land rights in rural areas. Many cases which we can supply you the details on. But to, in, in one way, this is the biggest story in land reform in South Africa because it affects one third of the population, communal areas. And we need to get clarity about what the issues are. And I think. Uh, people in this room can play a key role in informing society. Thank you. Thank you.